principles of patient safety and international patient safety go. So it's the nursing professional we are supposed to engage the patient for patient safety. So it's the patient center. The World Patient Safety Day was celebrated on 17 September 2023. And the patient safety starts, it's a system, the safety consists of the procedures we are doing, the environment where we are placed and the materials like monitors, DP apparatus or whatever maybe we are using and the training, whatever the, the nursing personnel has the training that is the competent nursing training and the culture of the team caring for the patient. So it's a complex system. So the best design system, we can reduce the error. The, complex system there will be more chance for others considering the nature of illness if you are maintaining a standards protocols and guidelines if you are stick on the protocol and guidelines we can decrease the error so here when the patient comes to healthcare setting already the patient will be ill so again if you are doing something wrong wrong procedure and wrong surgery again we are causing harmless to the patient Open learning, always uh, we have to learn from the error. So as a nursing person, we should be have an openness among the team members. If anyone is committing the error, we are always uh, try to share it up and solve the problem. And the patient safety depends on organizational and personal accountability. Trust. Trust is essential part for the patient safety. The members of the healthcare team must trust each other when there is any error, error of course, so that we can identify the error and we can then solve the issue. Coming to the principles of patient safety, there are five principles. The first one is proper identification of patients and matching to their care elements. Second, prevention of patient handover error and safety during transition. Third, assessing medical accuracy while giving care to a patient. Fourth, performance of correct procedure at correct body site. Fifth, take appropriate precautionary measures to avoid infections. Let us see the first one, proper identification of patient and matching to the care elements. Here, the Joint Commission requires two identifiers. First, we have to identify with the patient name and either date of birth or unique identification number. Second, prevention of patient handover error and safety during transition. So here, accurate and up-to-date information, we have to highlight, examine uh, the time of any investigation, examine post-apparent blood sugar, or if they want to receive any report, or if there is any time for antibiotics. This is all the important things should be highlighted when you are giving the handover. Assessing medical accuracy while giving care for a patient. So always make sure you are giving, uh, make sure you are giving correct care for the correct patient. And when you are assessing the patient, always the consultant also make sure the identification that is unique identifier number and the patient name by correct uh, identifying the proper patient before entering the medical care in order to recovery, restoration of function and survival of the patient. Performance of correct procedure at correct body set. That is correct site surgery procedure has been performed for the correct patient at correct anatomical site. So conversely we can say wrong site surgery called incorrect surgery means we are giving doing the wrong surgery for the wrong patient at the wrong site. So here it's the uh, concern form we will be filled before induction of anesthesia before skin incision, before patient leaves operation uh, room. So that is before induction of anesthesia. We have to identify the site, patient, and anesthesia checklist. We have to check the vitals of the patient, the airway, all these things we will check it. And before skin incision, again, the team of us will be confirmed the patient name, unique ID number, and it will be confirmed by patient, uh, surgeon and anesthetist, surgeon and anesthetist review will be done. And before patient leaves operation room, the name of the procedure recorded, the nurse, the scrub nurse should make sure that whatever the instrument sponge used to further surgery, everything has the uh, counted or what, everything she has to 
check it. After that, she will be shifting out the patient from the operating room. And take appropriate precautionary measures to avoid infection. As we know, that's how we will break the chain. First, we have to do by stopping the source of infection. Second, block the portal of exit by covering your nose and mouth and interruption, interrupting the mode of transportation by washing the hand and protect the portal of entry by wearing mask and increase cost defense by immunization. So here you can see the chain of transmission. Infectious agent, it's a reservoir, portal of exit, and there is a mode of trans transportation, then there is a portal of entry, then success level cost is causing infection. And Joint Commission of India is important for setting and promoting global patient safety standard. That is the international patient safety goals 2024. There are six goals. The first one is identify patient correctly. Second, improve effective communication. Third, improve the safety of high alert medication. Fourth, ensure correct procedure, correct patient surgery. And the fifth one is reduce the risk of healthcare associated infection. And the final one, reduce the risk of patient harm resulting from falls. How so we will identify patient correctly? So for IP patients, we will use the patient name and unique hospital identification number and the ambulatory care patient name, date of birth, age, emergency admit with no identification number, without unique number, we will be uh, we will be identified with the patient name and age. And in neonates and children up to three years, child name, unique hospital identification number and child father, mother ID number. And never Use bed number for patient identification. And patient identification. So whatever situation we will be identifying the patient. The first one before consultation. Second before procedure. Before medication administration. Before administering blood and blood products. Before taking blood sample. Before serving any diet. And before nurse assessment. Before diagnostic test. Before handing over discharge summary and investigation report. Second, improve effective communication. So, what are the situation we are supposed to be make sure that you are improve the effective communication when you are getting a verbal medication order only for specified situation. Then when you are reporting critical values, so always make sure the red back sticker is placed point of CAT testing, whether there is any increased value or decreased value. And handover transfer form, clinical kind of nursing handover. So it's more, it's a structured communication. So whenever you are communicating to someone, you have to make sure you are pointing out five elements. That is the focus on communication. Introduction, situation, background, assessment and recommendation. So introduction, you have to mention who are you, your role, where you are, and why you are communicating situation, what is happening at the moment, background, what are the issues that led up to this situation, assessment, what do you believe the problem is, and final recommendation, what should be done to correct the situation. Here we can see the scenario, Mrs. Guman is a 56 years old woman who was diagnosed with a heart failure four years ago. She has been admitted to the hospital for shortness of birth. She states, I was taking a dietetic at home, but rather two days ago, I have not been able to refill my prescription. She complains of difficulty breathing and noticed some swelling in her feet, and that she in the worse than usual. On physical examination, the patient was alert, oriented to person, place, and time. Respiratory assessment, she has shortness of breath and exhaustion. exhaustion. Oxygen saturation is 89% on room air. On auscultation, fine cracker bilateral in the lower lobes. When assessing her lower extremities, two pores plus edema bilaterally present. Vital signs, temperature 37 degree, BP 130 by 85, pulse 130, and respiration 35. And here we have to communicate with the, your higher authority to get the recommendation for this patient. So the first introduction, you have to introduce yourself by your name and you are supposed to say from where you are calling. And the situation, you have to tell the situation for 
about whom you are giving a call to your superior. So it will be mentioning your patient name, bed number, and what are the signs or symptoms of the patient. And background, if you have to tell the background features of the patient. So the patient's condition, what was the medication the patient is taking, and the hemodynamic status of the patient. And if there is any intervention was done, that report also I had to mention. And in assessment, what about your assessment, what have you done that you have to explain the patient mental status, neural changes, respiratory rate, refraction, pulse, peripheral pulse, etc. And the recommendations. So what you are recommending from your uh, the doctors so or have an available doctor is there any additional investigation to be done and any vital signs should be monitored and the patient if it's not improving any alternative medicine to be given. And the rest is the read back. So the read back always should be done when you are taking verbal order from doctors or telephonic order or even if you are reporting any critical results to the doctors. So these are the situation we have to do the read back policy order. And areas of critical findings, you will be seeing the critical findings in the laboratory. Example, if you are uh, reporting hemoglobin, hemoglobin is uh, going down less than 5, it's a critical. And if it's uh, radiology, if there is any changes, critical changes in MRI, remit testing, info, and catheter, that also immediately should be reported. And even in strain order, you have to read back critical lab diagnostic results. In read back, mainly we have to see the three things, listen, write, read back. The receiver of the order shall write down the complete order and then read it back. I am very free the same from the individual who is giving the order. And finally, our responsibility is to document the order. And it should be written in the appropriate place in the case sheet at the end. Effective communication. So effective communication is accurate transmission of information to ensure timely diagnosis and treatment. And the nursing responsibility, we have to very uh, act very fast in the emergency situation and we empower the patient and the family. And we have to coordinate among the health teams and clear instructions should be given for post-discharge care. Miscommunication in the health care. So some situation there may be a chance of miscommunication. In case a doctor prescribes 50 mg of medication, the nurse administer 500 mg. And the nurse instructs a patient to take their medication once a daily, but the patient interprets her twice daily. And non tamil speaking patient tries to explain the symptoms using gestures, the health care provider fails to understand. And the pharmacist mistreats a prescription dosage of 10 ml as 100 ml. This all the miscommunication will be taking place in the setting. Go three high alert double check and the medication involved in high percentage of errors and sentinel events, namely heparin, insulin, any narcotics, and medication that carry a high level of adverse outcome, that is the narcotics and look alike sound alike medications. And policies and procedures are developed to address identification, location, labeling. Always make sure you are keeping your segregated, the lookalike and sound alike medications. And the policies and procedures should be implemented in the particular organization or hospital. And the concentrated electrolytes should not be present in patient units. And it should be kept in a separate area with the label. High alert medications involved in high percentage of errors, mainly chemotherapy drugs, narcotic drugs, concentrated electrolytes like potassium chloride, potassium phosphate, sodium chloride, and magnesium sulfate. And magnesium sulfate, maximum 3 to 10 ambience, we can keep it to manage preeclampsia, lookalike, sound alike drug, and anesthetic. Then high alert sticker should be placed, double lock for narcotics, tall man lettering. It's like the patient, example, prednisone, prednisolone. If the two drugs we are keeping, always that uh, unique letter should be written in a capital, upper class and lower class, we have to write it. Store lookalike drugs, sound alike drugs in a separate rack, and we have to give color code for insulin storage. Concentrated electrolytes should be stored in specific areas, and independent, when we are using the
the no cortex always double check and double sign. And in case if you are using the no cortex, we have to replace the empty ampule. And if you are using only one mg of no cortex example and the remaining ML, if you are in a situation to discard, and then also as always we have to discard in the presence of doctor and the particular doctor's signature get to get it. Then high alert medication monitoring should be done by double two person. Then whatever the adverse events uh, happen for the patient due to the effect of any medication, it should be reported. Then go for eliminate wrong site, wrong patient, wrong procedure, wrong surgery. So wrong side surgery, it will be happening in the operation site. Sometimes uh, left side of the body instead of right side, they will be performing surgery. So wrong procedure refers to incorrect procedure. And the wrong patient refers to, uh, they may be performing the procedure to incorrect patient. So here reimbursement should be given to the patient. And the universal protocol we have to follow to prevent the wrong patient surgery, wrong procedure, and wrong set. So three things we have to do. The first one, pre-operative verification process. Second one, marking the operative site. Third, taking a timeout immediately before starting the procedure. Pre-operative verification process should be done with the help checklist. And the marking the operation site, the surgeon will be marking the operation site to avoid a wrong site surgery. And taking a timeout immediately before starting the procedure. So why we are taking a timeout? So timeout should be done by the team of the people those are involved for the patient surgery. The surgeon, anesthetist, scrub nurse, circulatory nurse. So it's a team work in order to uh, prevent the uh, errors which is caused during the surgery. And go for you reduce the risk of healthcare record infection so that we know that five moments of hand washing and seven steps of hand washing, we can minimize the error, minimize the risk of healthcare associated infection. And cyst will reduce the risk of patient harm resulting from falls. So here assess each individual patient risk for falling. Uh, we should have a mobility plan and caregivers should be in arms reach of patient and always we have to provide safe food gear, use bed alarm, conduct regular safety rounds, review or discontinue medication associated with the high risk of falls. And provide easy access to mobility aids, some additional aids and always keep patients involved in some activities implement a risk management system. Risk management system, mainly we will do the assessment and preventive measures we will take and analysis and the final recommendation we will do it. Who and when? For safety of the patient, mainly vulnerable assessment should be done. We know that uh, the people less than 18 years and above 60 years should be, and the psychiatric patients, uh, the physically disabled patients, these are all the, uh, the labor, the patient coming with the labor pain. So these are all the people will be coming under the vulnerable category. So when to be used, so it should be used, vulnerable assessment should be used, uh, the time of admission, and when the patient shifted from IC to ward, and OT to ward, and always we have to fill the most of all risk assessment tool should be filled and if the patient is getting less than 45 score, the reassessment should be done every seventh day. And uh, mainly it is a normal protocol which is followed in high dependency unit and intensive care unit. And safety measure, patient should not be left unattended and toward any incident if it's happened, it should be reported immediately. Always use the safety belt while transporting the patient, mainly wheelchair and rolling, bed should be locked always, writer should be recorded, safety brochure and fall prevention education should be given. In case of any falls or other incident report should be documented and uh, uh, patient falls education uh, that uh, form should be filled within 72 hours. And uh, sticker should be placed, side should be always up, 
and it's all the things should be looked after by the nurse or who is taking care of the patient. Patient should not be left unattended. Avoid slippery floors, accompany the patient to the washroom, and the toggle should be always should be reached with the patient. And all vulnerable patients, elimination needs should be met at the vulnerable category patients, child and adolescents up to 16 years, elderly above 65 years, physically challenged, terminal ill, women in labor or experiencing termination of pregnancy, patient with emotional or psychiatric disorders, and uh, any patient who are, who are not able to perform activities of daily living, and patient with some chronic pain, and patient suspected to drug or alcohol dependency, victims of abuse and neglect, patient with infectious or communicable diseases, or even the patient who are receiving chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and the fall risk assessment score is above 45. So let me conclude with the, the safety is first for the patient side, and we are the key for the patient's safety.